Uh, we are now. Okay, cool. Um, actually, what, what was the issue number? Um, it is 4926. 4926, yeah. Okay, so first I'll talk about, I guess, first I'll talk about the, um, the other one, the, the one I found before we get into this one and sort of how that happened. So uh, I do this, I, you know, this is why Anton was referencing Emacs because I, I was talking about this the other day. How I have this like terrible habit of when I'm taking notes on calls, I'll just like open a Vim file in whatever terminal window I'm in with like a random name and just start taking notes in there. And these like terminal tabs will collect over time until like weeks later, I put aside time to do my like cleanup, which is usually when I like tour through, a you know, 200 GitHub issues and like try to clear through my terminal. So you probably noticed that like my GitHub activity comes in these waves where I like go through everything all at once. Right. And so, um, and so, and so this happened and in one of these, in one of these sessions, I guess a couple weeks ago, I was like, you know, first I was cleaning up my terminal. So I'm going through all these tabs and looking at all this crap I've written down and trying to consolidate. And in one of these tabs at the top of the, at the top of the file, it was like, make sure we're still checking all the signatures in the Tenorment full note. And I guess on one of the calls, when we talked about how like the light client is now stopping after plus two thirds, it like occurred to me just, you know, suddenly like, oh, uh, you know, we better make sure the full node is not stopping after checking two thirds. And I wrote that down. And then like a few weeks later was in a position where I was like, okay, I could actually look into this now. Like, let me just go do that. And um, so of course I did and realized that, uh, you know, we're not, we're not checking them. Um, and so that, that's when I opened that first issue. So um, I don't know, I don't know what the thought process was that initially initially triggered that, you know, oh, better make sure think, thinking about the full node, I guess I'm uh, a pretty, I mean, having, knowing the code base pretty well and thinking about, um, you know, the like client as, as like an independent process and always being wary of like things sharing functionality um, sort of triggered that. I don't know if there's any, if there's any like real lesson about how to make that, um, that kind of discovery more uh, accessible or obvious, but yeah, just to speak to that for a second. I mean, part of why I wanted to do this session or, or like asked you to, to speak about this with everyone was to try to build people's debugging skills, right. In the consensus reactor. Um, but debugging is like fundamentally, um, an exercise in intuition and you can't really explain it. Like intuition almost by definition is something that you can't explain. So I kind of was like, hey, Ethan, come come explain to everyone like on a recorded call, this thing that is fundamentally unexplainable inside your head. Um, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, yeah. But anything you can do to tell us about like, yeah, anything that occurred to you, what you, the order in which you were able to think of things, um, anything you noticed, uh, any previous, things that had happened that maybe helped you think of this this time around. Um, I mean, just anything like that is, is helpful to hear, even if it's maybe yeah. doesn't seem immediately connected. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess part of it is I, um, I'm like, I can be, I'm like super anal about things actually, which is both a personality flaw, but when you're dealing with like, you know, security protocols or whatever, I guess it's actually a strength. Um, and so I spend probably more time than I should thinking about like, trying to make sense in my head of each field in the data structures and how they need to be validated and what it means if they're not validated. And, you know, as we were building the light client in Rust as well, we were thinking a lot about this, like, oh, do we need to check that field? You know, and it's like, well, if we don't check that field, then, you know, how could it have been that that field got generated in an invalid way? And so that if we don't check it and we don't catch that invalidity, what does it mean we could be missing? And in most cases, it's like, well, you know, plus two thirds were malicious or, or something like that. But um, so I am, I'm thinking about those kinds of things like all the time. And when we're talking about making breaking changes to the protocol, you know, those are always the things I'm thinking about, like the, the validity changes and, and valid for who and when and where. Um, and so I guess with this, with this, with this, uh, you know, stop after plus two thirds, it was like immediately like, okay, what does that mean then if the rest of the things that it didn't check were invalid, right? So whenever you're not checking something, I'm always thinking, well, so then what happens if it's invalid? What, did, what do you miss, right? And it's like, well, if you're a light client, you don't miss much because you already verified plus two thirds and that's your security model anyway. Uh, but if you're a full node, 
you know, or anyone else checking this thing, which is really, I guess, just the full node, um, then you might be missing a lot. And so that's where, um, that's what triggered that. And then, you know, when I looked into it, it was like, okay, yeah, this is a, and then I spent some time trying to actually figure out, well, so what is the attack here? Right? Like, okay, so now full node has this, you know, there's this invalid data, but like, uh, what can you actually do with it? Um, so when, yeah. when you wrote that note to yourself, I mean, and I realize you probably don't remember doing it, but like when you wrote that note, do you recall if you knew that there was going to be a problem if two thirds or if full nodes were not checking past two thirds signatures or was it just like, oh, that would be interesting. Like, I wonder if that could cause a problem. Well, I knew that it was, it would be, it would be wrong. Like it would be okay. <laughs> not, it's not like correct for the full node not to verify all the data. That's like the definition of the full node, right? Sure. sure. Okay. At the moment, like I wasn't even thinking about it. I wasn't, I didn't know what the implications would be. It was just that like, that needs to be happening. And if it's not, then we might, we'll have, we might have to investigate further. And then, you know, in, after realizing that it wasn't happening, I stopped to think, okay, so what does this mean? What are the attacks? And it's like, you know, fortunately it didn't seem like there was any real like uh, safety attack, right? It's just like a proposer could include garbage in the signatures, but uh, they could balloon the size of blocks. Cause I don't know if there was a limit on, I mean, there's like a max uh, total block size, but um, so they could potentially spam the network a little further um, and they could like, you know, get their, uh, they could game the incentivization layer a little bit by getting their proposer bonus without actually waiting for signatures from those other proposed from other validators. But it, it's kind of a weird, it, it's not like a big problem, right? Because um, no one is really getting attacked by it. Uh, in fact, other validators who maybe aren't even online might be benefiting from it because the proposer is including fake signatures from them and, you know, they're offline or something. And so, um, yeah. Right. Anton, are you going to say something? Uh, just a minor comment that we checked that validator, validator's count is equal to the signature's count. So no DDoS. But the, they, we, don't check the, we don't check the size of the signature. So oh, I was yeah. playing around and you can make like a signature that's like 10 kilobytes and, and, you know, Tenorman would accept it. So maybe that's, that's actually something we ought to check is, you know, uh, put a limit on the signature size. Um, and that would, you know, further reduce the potential for things like this to cause a problem. But um, yeah. Okay. So you notice this problem, open the issue. Um, I think Anton then fixed for this bug. I think Anton then fixed it um, after you opened the issue. Um, Anton, did you, did you have anything to add about the process of like fixing this bug? Um, not really. I, yeah, just like after reading the, the issue, I realized that it is in fact wrong and the full node should verify everything. And yeah, it just so went and changed the code. Cool. Uh, yeah, pretty straightforward fix as I recall. Yeah, we basically just needed to separate the functions so that we have one for the light client verification and one for the full node. Yeah. Right. And it's obviously um, very, uh, you know, compelling to try to combine those and deduplicate. I mean, as programmers, we're always trying to do that stuff, but, you know, uh, it, it can obviously be dangerous when, when their functions are actually supposed to run in very different contexts. And yeah. We've had long, uh, team calls actually about the joys of duplicating your code. Yeah. I see Callum smiling because he has been subjected to uh, too many of these. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm well acquainted with the the, the joys of that. The deduplication calls. The reduplication calls. Reduplication, yeah, de yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. De de oh, that's right. <laughs> um, cool, Marco. Were you going to say something? Uh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Um, cool. Okay. So that one was, you know, uh, kind of a flash of insight, but relatively straightforward fix. Um, should we talk about the consensus issue that the Blue Zell team opened? Yeah. So, then, so, you know, so I, I wrapped up that. I'm, I continue going through my weeks of terminal tabs, close those all down, then get on GitHub and start clearing through, you know, my backlog of like months of Tenorman issues and, you know, showing up in random PRs that have been closed for months and like adding a random comment or whatever. And then I come across this, uh, uh, you know, cause, cause usually actually the way it happens is all like, I will, it's worse than that because I will, I will go through a bunch of notifications and I'll like 
close out the ones that are like, obviously, okay, looks good, looks good, looks good. And then ones that are like, uh, I probably need to think a little bit more about this. I'll like leave it in a browser tab. So not only do I collect these terminal tabs with notes, I also collect these browser tabs of like things to look at later. And so I had a whole, I had a whole browser's worth of tabs of like old tenement notifications that I had opened probably weeks earlier and just like hadn't gotten to. And so I'm starting to go through those and I come across this one and uh, I was like, oh my God, I wonder if this is the bug I just found. And so I'm trying to like, you know, so I go down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how to replicate this issue using this like plus two thirds verify commit stop early thing. Um, and I wasted a lot of time on that because it, you know, that wasn't the bug. And I was like really excited that I found this bug and it's going to solve this, this user's problem. And uh, it was a total dead end because I could not, I could not replicate the issue um, by, you know, using that. So I'm, so, you know, I'll share, I'll share the screen and then, um, so this, so this is the issue. Um, so uh, this guy, NJ Maraca from the, yeah, from Bluezell. So they have some SDK app. Um, they're using Tendermint 33.3. Um, and, you know, what happened to them was that they did a, they did a chain upgrade. So they restarted the chain uh, and then they got into this mess. Uh, proposal block invalid with increasing rounds, right? So it seems that somehow they got into a state where um, everyone is proposing a block that nobody can validate. Uh, and so, you know, I was, I was like, oh, you know, this is uh, maybe there, these signatures are getting in and these signatures are invalid. And somehow, for some reason, even though people aren't verifying everything, you know, they're finding these invalid signatures and it didn't really make sense. And I was trying to sort of shoehorn, shoehorn this thing in um, and I couldn't make it work, uh, you know, and they, and he talked about how he would restart and, um, you know, there actually wasn't that, there isn't that much information in here to go on. So it's kind of, it's kind of a struggle. The main takeaway was that, you know, they did a, they did an upgrade. Um, I think we found out, uh, Anton was asking that, um, uh, that they didn't actually change their chain ID. You know, the logs didn't have anything other than this invalid proposal. Um, you know, we asked for this, which we asked for in the original issue, but didn't provide. And so, you know, maybe we can make that clearer for people because this is, this was actually the gold mine when we finally got it. Um, and uh, this happened, I think, another time for him. It's, uh, I'll add a little more commentary on like intuition here, which is just sure. that one of the other things actually is that like you, it's interesting that you say, you know, there's like this long issue that he's opened and you say there's not that much information here actually, <laughs> which is, is really interesting actually, because like, it, you know, to, to a casual observer, to someone who doesn't know the system, to someone who hasn't tried to debug this kind of issue before, it looks like a lot of information. But because yeah. you've done this before, this is certainly not your first rodeo. You can kind of like scroll through this and say, hmm, say pretty quickly. Hmm, there's not actually that much here that's helpful. I and the thing that would quick. be helpful is, is um, <laughs> this dump consensus state, for example. Yeah. I, actually, I actually first tried to ignore a bunch of the content because I was like, okay, I probably don't need all this. And then I meticulously went through every line to try to look for clues and <laughs> didn't find them. Uh, I think I probably did that twice or something. Um, so... Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, so then a bit, a bit of conversation, uh, you know, without this data, it's, it's almost impossible to debug. And I think I was doing this on, I was looking at all this stuff on a Friday. Um, and I think by, uh, the Sunday, um, I was looking at it again. I was, I was trying to replicate it again for whatever reason. And I noticed that he had commented. So just by like complete fluke, the weekend I happened to be looking at this was the weekend he showed up um and had more information and so he shows you know he shows the log again you have the same thing proposal block invalid um you know the rounds are ticking up we've got this wrong signature in this case it's from it's from validator zero you know this this log line isn't that helpful because we have a signature here and like you know what are you going to do with a signature it doesn't really tell you anything so you know uh it'd be nice to know you know what this log should probably tell us what the signature is for um if possible but it's actually uh, with the new block structure, we actually don't know what the signature is for. Like, we assume it's for the block, right? Um, so that, that's a bit of a, a challenge. So, uh, and then this was, this was super informative. So he didn't give this before, um, but he said when he restarted the node, he said this before, but he didn't give the log, but then he showed that, okay, the thing crashed trying to reconstruct the last commit. Um, failed to verify the vote uh, with this pub key. 
and invalid signature, right? So, so this, what, what this tells us, so before all we knew was that someone is proposing a block um, that has an invalid signature, right? And I mean, blocks where are the signatures that are in the last commit. Uh, okay, so we know that, but um, here it became even, even clearer that actually the problem is somehow in the last commit, that the last, you know, and this is after a restart. So this thing is, uh, this thing is being reconstructed from the vote set. And, and all of that is, uh, is basically on disk over the restart. Um, and so when we're trying to reconstruct this thing from the set of votes, we actually, the votes themselves, we know what block the vote is for. And so, uh, you know, again, it's not really, this log line isn't, isn't really telling us that much, but then we can go and dive in. Um, so, and, and you also said that what was really helpful was getting the dump consensus state, but this is just like, uh, a, like a log line, right? This is just yeah, this, this, you can't really figure it out from this. I mean, maybe with intuition, you could have, you could have understood and, and, and sort of discovered. I wasn't able to at this point. I okay. sort of started to get intuition that this might be about the, uh, the commit upgrade that we did. And I, you know, I had, I had been wary or nervous about that whole, because that, that was a big breaking change. And that was the first, that's the first big breaking change we've done to Tendermint in a long time. Um, and it's addressing like a, you know, really core data structure of the commit. And so I've always been sort of worried that we were going to do this thing and, you know, something, you know, in the back of my mind, something was going to, we were going to miss something. I sort of always anticipated that we were going to miss something, but you know, you never know where that's going to happen. And so, um, so finally, yeah. So I asked for this, this, this was critical. Um, uh, asked about, uh, you know, are you changing the chain ID? Um, so they're not changing the chain ID. Um, and uh, no change to the chain ID. This time they're saying there is no upgrade, but um, they had done upgrades in the past, right? And they're reusing the chain ID. So it's possible there were old nodes around. Um, and obviously this is, this is a big, big no-no um, to not change your chain ID through an upgrade and can cause massive headaches for you because it could, it could mean validators are double signing accidentally um, and then they all get slashed and you won't know why. Um, so, you know, we tell people don't do this. But in practice, we may not have ever discovered this, uh, this bug if someone wasn't doing this and finding it, right? Obviously, it should be fine. The chain shouldn't halt like this in an invalid way. You know, what should happen is everyone should get slashed and then the chain should halt because all the validators are, are slashed, right? Um, and at least that we can understand. We can say, we can tell the user they screwed up. But here, you know, he, this guy was, uh, was super worried. He kept saying, um, you know, we're very alarmed that this is happening, like, you know, with, this must be, we hold 97% of the power. So this is like one validator who's breaking the whole network, obviously, um, obviously very alarming. So then, then he provided this stuff. Um, and this, uh, and then, you know, so very quickly, I actually figured out what was going on realized this is a pretty serious security bug. And so stopped giving him information because at that point I'm like, okay, we need to, uh, um, you know, we need to go into security mode. So, um, so I think, so, you know, it looks like we were stuck on this and we were, we were stuck for a while simply because we didn't have enough information. And as soon as we got the information, um, I think anyone on, anyone on the team uh, probably would have been able to, by looking at this, figure out, um, figure out what happened. I just happened to be there on the Sunday working, you know, I shouldn't be working on Sundays, but um, doing this because I was obsessed with, the, with, with trying to understand what was going wrong here. Um, and so if you look at, so here's the dump consensus state he provided. Um, it's massive, uh, and so my browser doesn't want to load it um, because oh, that, oh shit, there it is. Um, okay, I might have to actually refresh. There we go. So I thought I had a JSON thing, but I guess I don't. So uh, you know, so I immediately went to look for the last commit here. So I was like, okay, we we know from the logs there's a problem with the last commit. Um, there's the hash. Um, hello. Okay, I'm just going to open this in Vim because this is ridiculous. Um, so I copied it in here. What's up? So changing the chain ID is that, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying that 
one more thing why does why uh, why you shouldn't restart your chain without uh changing the chain id is that anybody can submit a duplicate vote evidence against any validator yeah if they have all data so like you have, you you can essentially flash any validator exactly so everyone everyone deserves to get slashed when this happens um, and they were lucky that, you know, that wasn't, that didn't happen. But so if we go look for the, the last commit here, um, you know, so there's, there's tons of data in this thing. It's like, what is that? A hundred thousand lines, right? So it's not something you can really scroll through. You sort of have to know what you're looking for. Um, so here is, um, here is the last commit. And, um, you know, again, with our new commit structure, it's not easy to see that something's going wrong because we're looking at these signatures and you know, they're all for block ID flag two, which means they're for the block ID. You have the validator address. Okay, great. You know, timestamp signature. You can't really get that much out of it, but, but what do you notice? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but anyone notice anything fishy? One signature is for a different date. Yeah. A month earlier. A different month. It's for a different month. <laughs> So I saw this and I was like, well, this is fishy, right? Um, so obviously this came from the last time they ran, you know, cause I'm, I'm taking it for granted that the, the user is not lying to me, that he's being honest, that we have some information about what happened. And so this thing is suggesting that, um, you know, we're getting a signature from a month ago. So then I start looking at, okay, let's go look at this validator. This is the zero with, this is the zero with validator. The issue that was where the, the problem was with um zero four c b b f so we start going to look for that so it takes us immediately um to uh to the vote section right and so this is the votes of the you know of the consensus state and if we look at this thing okay so the pre votes everyone's voting um you know for nothing the, the block id here in round zero and then in the pre commits for whatever reason this guy is voting for a block um this FB189 while everyone else is voting zero. And that's where, and we have the, the fishy timestamp, right? So uh, weirdly his pre-vote is from the original, is, is the correct timestamp. So maybe, maybe, you know, I guess it means this validator is running two nodes, one a new one, one an old one, and they're racing each other on the same network. And, you know, so it's just like whichever vote you see first. So this is from the new, this is from the new node and this one is from the old node, right? And so I saw this and I was like, okay, well, it looks like this guy is trying to commit something, something fishy. So let's go look for that, that block. Um, oh. There's nothing there. FB189. Uh, oh, I thought this was going to show something. Um, I guess not. Or wouldn't so, it be but, correct to not show something? Because that means that the block doesn't exist in current state. Um, yes, but I thought there was a, there was gonna there was another uh, indication with it. Um, and I'll start from the top here. So, uh, oh, so what happened? I thought there was a. Um, I don't remember if I thought it was off, but uh, yeah, this commit. Uh, so this, there's a, there's a few last commits in this data structure. So one is actually the actual commit structure. This is the first one we were looking at. Um, and this, because this is actually in a block. So I think what we're looking at here is the proposal block. Um, Hey, sorry. I guess my internet just cut out. Yeah, no um, worries, yeah. but I think you're back now. Okay. So um, if I knew how to use Jason and Vim better, uh, I'd be able to show things better, but I don't know if anyone, if anyone knows off the top of their head how to make it, how to collapse things. But anyway, I'm pretty sure this is inside a block. Uh, and so this is the last commit within the block. And so it has the new commit structure. And so we didn't get that much information out of this, but there's also a last commit that shows you 
all the votes. So this is the last commit from the perspective of the consensus state, which isn't the commit structure in the block, actually. Uh, and that, this is where, this is where everything became clear. Because if you look at this, everyone, same block, six. Ethan, I'm losing you again. For this other thing, seven. And this is, So, so that some we're letting uh, we're letting old votes into our last commit, um, and then they're making their way into um, into the actual block, right? And so, you know, this the, the combination of these two last commits kind of made the issue clear, which was that we actually accepted this vote because it's a valid pre-commit vote for a block, and you know, it's signed by a validator. The timestamp is totally whack, but that's not something we really check. Um, so it made it into our vote set, but then uh, it's not a problem that it made it into the vote set, but it is a problem that it made it into the actual commit structure, right? Which, which suggested that we're actually not filtering what gets into the, mit, into the commit, we're just taking everything that's in our vote set and putting it in a commit, right? And so then I went and looked at the, um, at the vote set thing. So if I go, if I just check this out, I guess. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, you know, so we have this like make proposal block function. Um, I don't know exactly where it is now. It's gonna take me a minute to find it, but um, make proposal, is that right? Create proposal or something like that. Um, yeah, so we have this create proposal block and uh, in here, Um, so it goes and makes block from the state, which is the main thing. And um, this thing goes and makes the block. Sorry, it's a bit, it's a bit of a maze actually. Sorry, Bucky, quick question. Uh, why would we want a vote in the vote set and not in the commit? Why would we want any vote that wasn't uh, applicable to a commit? Because um, we collect uh it's it's possible for people to send pre-commits for for blocks that aren't going to be committed why would we want that because it's, it's part of the way the consensus works because until you know what block is being committed you don't know what block is being committed and so you have to allow pre-commits for potentially conflicting blocks uh-huh because you so don't have because, value well because you don't know so you don't actually so first of all it might serve as evidence but also the way the way the consensus works across rounds, you don't know what people are seeing and you don't know what is actually true yet, right? So it could be that what you think is true is actually Byzantine. And so you think people are, are pre-committing for one thing and you're starting to gain uh, evidence for that, but then you find out actually there are pre-commits for this other block. And so you need to be able to tolerate uh, pre-commits for both so that um, you could potentially, you could ultimately detect what is correct and so that you could gather evidence. Mm -hmm. So in the consensus itself, it needs to be able to be in this state where it's collecting pre-commits for potentially conflicting blocks. And then ultimately when, when one of them is definitively uh, committed, then you only want to include the pre-commits that were actually for that block. And then the other ones we know for sure we're not Byzantine because we have no reason to believe that there was right and wrong when the perfect person made that pre-commit vote. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Where is uh, make block? Can you help me out here? Uh, uh, Types dot make block. Is that not a thing? It's in state slash state. Types dot, yeah, but where's that types dot make block? Oh, in test util. Oh, that's weird. Well, that doesn't belong there. Um, right, so it's just populating this last commit. So it, this actually wasn't helpful. It was in, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting exactly where everything was, but I think uh, when we went to um, create proposal block, there we go. Yeah, it's actually here, right? So this, this is the function in the consensus state that goes and creates the proposal block. And it actually draws the commit from here. So from the consensus state last commit, so if you look at what this thing is, it's actually a, um, it's a vote set. 
Um, so, you know, here's our consensus date. We have this last commit and it's a vote set, right? So it's going to contain all those votes with all the information in them. And then ultimately we call last commit on that. Uh, we call make commit on that vote set. Um, so in here, right? And this is, and this is the old version of the code. And we just go and we add every single vote, no matter what. We don't check them, right? And this thing is just going to turn it into a, uh, you know, the new commit SIG, SIG struct, which drops the block ID because it was redundant and just says, you know, that it's for a block ID because it's not nil and it's not absent, right? Uh, um, and so, and, and so then, <clears throat> then it became, you know, very clear what's happening here that in the vote set, we have pre-commits for potentially arbitrary blocks and we're not filtering them when we make the commit. So we end up with a commit that has signatures that are for the wrong block. And then when people go to verify those signatures, uh, when they're going to pre-vote on it, when they receive the proposal block, then it's invalid. And so at that point, then it was, then, uh, you know, then we, I was able to reproduce it with a, with a small test. Um, that was actually, I was actually impressed at, um, I was impressed that I was able to reproduce it because it, it you know, so I, I set up this, uh, cause we have, so we have these tests in the consensus reactor that actually set up networks like this reactor test thing where it sets up an in-process, um, an in-process network with a bunch of switches and connects them all together and then runs it and makes sure that they all create blocks. And we use this, we've used this to like try to try to test Byzantine behavior where one of the switches is actually like a, a Byzantine node that does like a Byzantine decide proposal and Byzantine pre-vote or whatever, um, and tries to fool everyone. And in the past, like, you know, four years ago, it was a, you, you know, a Byzantine node was able to halt the network. And this was the test we used to actually capture that. But <clears throat> I mean, you know, we all know the peer-to-peer -peer layer is very it, it actually didn't take me that long to write this thing that replicated the issue where basically a a Byzantine validator did an invalid um, basically put together he sent a, a pre-commit um, to everyone that had uh, arbitrary, just an arbitrary block cache, right? So make a, make a, make a pre-commit for an arbitrary block, send it to everyone, uh, to everyone on the peer list so that in, in theory, they would all receive it. It would go into their vote set and whoever the proposer is would end up proposing a block that has this thing in it. And we would get that behavior, that invalid proposal block behavior, um, that was reported in the issue. And this test was actually able to replicate that. So I was actually very pleased that we had the infrastructure to be able to replicate this um, pretty quickly as much as we, as much as we hate on the, the peer to peer layer and still writing this, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of magic hidden in here. Um, that's kind of gross and, and unfortunate. And, uh, in principle, there should be easier ways to actually, um, to actually write a test like this. But, uh, you know, we do have, we do have ways to write a uh, really interesting tests that capture this kind of behavior. And so potentially we could use that to write, uh, lots more interesting tests where there's lots more kinds of invalid behavior. Um, so we could potentially catch these things, uh, sooner, but anyways, then ultimately the fix, um, was pretty straightforward. <clears throat> um, we basically have a, uh, uh, vote set, make commit <clears throat> where we now, we now filter, right? So before we were just adding everything and now we're saying if the commit sig is for a block, and it doesn't equal um, the what the vote set match twenty three. So this match twenty three is like a you know this vote set data structure is a bit weird, but this match twenty three is like uh, the two thirds majority. So if there are two thirds majority votes for a particular block within this vote set, then this match twenty three field gets set, um, and you know we check that it's not nil, right? Because if you get to make commit and that thing is nil, then something has gone terribly wrong, and you know there's a bug in the code somewhere. So. Uh, so we know that thing is already uh, created. Um, and then we check if this thing is for a block and it's not for that, then uh, drop that signature, right? And so, you know, I would point out this means, and we actually, we had this conversation in the issues when we discussed, um, when, we, when we were discussing this commit, uh, this commit upgrade, this change. And I think the idea that we would have to filter this never made it into the ADR and we sort of lost track of this, of this problem. And so, you know, it, it ended up in the code and, and we found it later, but we were discussing in one of the issues because the commits before 34 or before 33 commits could include invalid votes. So a commit, a valid commit could actually include a vote 
for a different block. And when you're verifying the commit, you would just go through and you would check all the signatures and make sure the signature is for what it says it is, but you would only count it, like you would only tally the voting power if it was actually for the right block. And when we did the commit upgrade, we had a, we had a discussion about, should we continue to allow commits for the wrong block? And you know, we, we, we wanted to know if you should allow them for nil, for the wrong block, whatever. And we decided to keep the votes for nil, but not to keep the votes for the wrong block. And so, in the new commit structure, you know, the, the block flag, the block ID flag um, type, we only have three, either it's for the actual commit or it's absent or it's nil. We didn't include another one that was like, you know, block ID flag different or other invalid or whatever, right? And if we did that, we would have also had to include the actual block ID that those votes are for, which would have potentially made the commit much larger and, and no one could come up with a with a good use case for why we would include pre-commits for the wrong block. And so we dropped it and we had that discussion explicitly, but neglected to actually outline in the ADR that when we make the commit, we have to ensure that this only applied to the block. It didn't apply to the consensus reactor. So the consensus reactor was still gonna potentially accumulate votes for the wrong block in its vote set. And that in the make commit, we had to, um, we had to really, we had to filter it out. So this is like a, you know, an issue around, we, we spent all this time looking at the data structure and thinking about the data structure and, and its validity. And, you know, we did a great job there. And then, uh, you know, but it's, how is this data structure created? Well, it's created from another data structure, the vote set, you know, which is populated inside the consensus reactor in a different way. And sort of that, that coupling kind of didn't make it as clearly into the design process for this, for this data structure change. And so we missed this. And so, you know, I, I guess the lesson here is, you know, when we're making the, when we're uh, addressing these core data structures, we have to think about how they're being created and what the source is for them. And then, uh, you know, what might be in the source that's not allowed in the data structure and, and sort of better address that, um, that linkage there, uh, which is challenging because, you know, there's, there's potentially a lot of coupling and the source might be, you know, somewhere else that's harder to think about and is running in a different protocol. And so, um, yeah. Uh, just another example in this code base where coupling between different components has led to subtle bugs because the interface between them hasn't been, uh, you know, as clear as you'd want them to. And, and, you know, nothing about, you know, it, it, it's kind of unfortunate that you have to get this deep into the code to realize that actually, you know, this thing needs to not be here. It'd be nice if this could somehow, somehow be surfaced differently. Um, uh, it more explicitly say, but I don't know exactly what that would be. And this was a very quick, you know, three line fix for a, uh, for a, a, a pretty nasty bug. So, uh, yeah. It sounds like this is also sort of in, in listening to you recount, like the conversations uh, about this change that introduced this bug. Um, it sounds like this is another reason to jump on Sean's uh, consolidated spec repo uh, stuff. So maybe we've like taken this conversation back around where we started. Yeah, I don't know if, if having a spec repo would have solved this because everyone would have been focused on the um, protocol, on the data structures, and we were very focused on the data structures, and the data structure is fine. It's a, it's a great new data structure that saves everyone like tons of bytes, and we were all very happy with it. And where we, where we actually missed out was in this some, somewhat in the architecture, but also thinking about, yeah, what, uh, you know, the proposer now needs to take this extra step to be careful not to actually introduce... Um, a vote for the wrong thing. So let me actually see if I can invalid. We can pull up the issue where we, where we talked about this. One um, question that I have from our interface boundary perspective is um, so we can construct invalid objects, right? So we could, the, the method of constructing objects can somehow leave them in a invalid state. Is there a reason for that? Well, so yes, yeah, so this is what I was getting at because the the challenge is the source object is valid and the target object is invalid. And the validity depends on signature verification, right? And so you don't want to have to go and re revalidate the signature, but it certainly should be the case that when you're populating that commit object, only votes that are for the right block ID should be allowed in. And I don't know if there's a, if there's a, you know, nice clean way, because I mean, the reality is you can always populate a block short of re-verifying every signature when you're creating the block, you're always going to be able to make a block object that is invalid signatures, right? Sure. So, so one idea that would be clean might be to only depend on a type, which can be exclusively constructed 
when it has valid signatures. And that, that is the dependency um, for uh, this part of the code. As in, it wouldn't use like a block in general, it'd use a different type, a different but, type that can be constructed. But keep in mind, all these signatures were valid. They were valid with respect to the block ID they were signatures for, but they might have been for different block IDs, right? And so, oh. I don't know how to how we could have we, we could better capture that say in the type system. It is I agree with you that it, it feels bad that we were able to you know so easily construct an object that had an invalid thing in it from an object that was fully valid, right? And that's really the you know, there was this filter that was missing that somehow constructing the thing, you know, we needed to, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it could be that, um, you know, it, it could be the, it, it, it's possible that the problem is in the, um, in the commit sig, right? So here, here magic is happening, right? Because here um, we're actually, uh, you know, so when we do this, we're turning one, we're turning a vote into a, um, Oh, it's not even in there. It's in the vote, right? So that's where we're actually turning a vote into a commit sig. And that was, you know, what, what this, what the, the block upgrade was all about. So possibly what we should have done is pass the block ID in here. Yeah. Right. If we pass the block ID in here and then we checked that the block ID was, was, uh, was correct, that it actually matched that, uh, not just that it was complete, but that it actually matched what we wanted it to, then then this filter would have happened implicitly inside here. And maybe that would actually be a better way to do it. Um, to be honest, yeah. I would be like, uh, okay, this is going to ripple across the code base. And I don't know if I want to make all those changes all at once, but maybe but not that, but it, it seems like we're doing like, like consensus is inherently like the finite state machine where we're kind of turning different state that we accumulate at different stages into other state that we need at different stages. And this is going to be modeled through an implicit dependency graph. And it might be interesting when we do this in Rust, to uh, do it as an explicit dependency graph. We kind of collect things and like aggregate state, and then it actually transitions into different types that are sort of like asserted correct at construction, uh, just as an idea. I think it'd be difficult as you as you outlined to sort of make that kind of change at this level, just because of how we do consensus uh, in Go. But th I think that would probably be what we'd want in, uh, in Rust. Yeah, and I mean, obviously we can we can work towards those kinds of things in Go too, and, and probably to really, to do this properly, because like I was saying, this is, this doesn't look nice, uh, but this looks a lot nicer, right? And so if, if you have this and this thing, but you know, then this thing would need to be able to return an error, right? That's why I didn't do it because I was like, okay, this, that would be a much larger change for this to return an error and everywhere it's called to handle that error. Um, you know, mostly that's in tests, otherwise it's here. And if this thing would return, well, I guess actually, no, it doesn't, it shouldn't return an error. It would just return uh, uh, absent, right? So um, yeah, so if it's nil, it returns absent. And you know, else if uh, uh, if it is that a thing? No, I, I can't even remember how to write Go sometimes. <laughs> I haven't written it in so long. Otherwise, if it's uh, else if uh, the block IDs don't match, right? If the vote dot block ID, um, you know, something like this is not. But not I guess like so, I, I'm watching you write this. I'm ready. I'm watching you read and write this code, and yeah. my question is like, how do you? understand the implications of the code that you are writing and or how would you suggest someone else understand the implications of the code that you're writing it's not easy um there's a lot of pieces and uh it's hard to reason about all of them together because there, there's a lot of coupling and it's hard to think about things in isolation um yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a, a quick, easy answer for that, but. Okay. No, no, I, I think that's, that's okay. I just wanted to, because that was my impression. My, my impression is like, I, I'm following along and, and I think I understand the general thrust of what you're doing, uh, but, but zooming out, I don't know if I could do it. That's kind of the thesis of this exercise, actually. Um, there's not probably a good way to like generalize I don't think Ethan can like give us a recipe, like just do these things, think about these things. Here's how you know these things are interconnected. And, you know, partly that is like the code base has a lot of unfortunate coupling and is, is a challenging code base in a lot of ways. Um, but my hope is that by going over some of these things together, like as a team, uh, we can almost try to like get that experience secondhand of going through it and try to just like pick up 
some of the thinking and, and learn from those experiences kind of through osmosis. So yeah, it seems like we kind of need to, um, and maybe one approach, so this is super, so first of all, thank you, uh, Ethan, for, for this thorough, and I don't know if you're done, I don't want to like hijack uh, your, your presentation. Uh, but I'm, I'm in my back of my mind, I'm thinking it'd be useful while to like, with this real concrete use case of understanding the dependency graph and consensus in terms of like making it more secure and robust. Uh, it might be interesting to do another session in which we just walk through the dependency graph of objects and, uh, and how consensus works. To, to sort of get like the, the the talk behind the talk. So right now you're solving a specific issue, but um, to better be able to to do such a thing in, in, in your absence or uh, uh, maybe to help you do these sorts of things, it'd be interesting to really focus on the dependency graph as it applies to consensus, like this object comes from that, this object comes from that. And maybe we, we take some notes, we, t we keep uh, some remarks of like where we've been, like a little trail. Uh, and then maybe that trail can turn into something uh, really some, something really meaningful, like some kind of diagram or an update to the spec talk or in the new spec repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would probably be super valuable. Yeah, and, I will also like, say that, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so like one of the things that sort of bugs me about this is that this wasn't caught by any tests, right? Uh, and I think for like these complex systems that are really difficult to reason about, especially when it comes to like edge cases and stuff, uh, I think like the only reasonable way to deal with this is to have like really good fussing tests yeah. uh, where you like set up a network and there are certain invariants we know that always has to hold, like a single node should never be able to take down a network. So like if you can generate like a Byzantine node, it just generates random inputs. Uh, and just make sure that those aren't able to hold the network. I think that would have triggered uh, for this bug, perhaps. Exactly, and I think and I think that's kind of what what I was getting at when, when I was talking about this test infrastructure we have here, which actually, all things considered, you know, is is kind of good and was you know it wasn't that hard to replicate this, which suggests that we probably could put in. Uh, I think Callum has been working on on this a little bit, like uh, on writing some Byzantine more Byzantine tests and. Um, you know, there's, there's reasonable infrastructure to do it. This isn't many lines of code to actually write a test that caught this. Um, and basically, you know, all we'd have to do is like fuss with this and, and add more random stuff in here. Um, so we can, we could, we could use what we already have to do the fuzzing. Now it's whether or not we'll be able to debug the results easily is another, is another story, but, um, yeah. And, and obviously this could still be improved tremendously if we could like, you know, uh, decouple the, the switches and just have more direct, like, consensus reactor to consensus reactor kind of thing. But, uh, and we might need, uh, the other thing I realized is we might need more hooks into the consensus reactor. Um, you know, I'm like, you know, I had to abuse this pre-vote function to, to send a pre-commit, right? Uh, and I mean, I guess it's a Byzantine node, so it's doing whatever he wants in this pre-commit, in this pre-vote thing. But uh, because ordering ends up being so important in the, you know, the order, like, if, if, if this was sent a little bit late, nobody would have cared about it, right? And so it wouldn't have actually triggered the bug. And so it needs to be sent early enough that everyone receives it. Um, and so, yeah, the fuzzing, the fuzzing can be hard, but I definitely think we could get a lot of value out of more fuzzing for this. And, you know, Lord knows what other bugs might pop up. Maybe some, that, you know, it's not, it's not unlikely that there are bugs lurking that have been there since the beginning, right? Like, um, so. There is so much to do. <laughs> yeah, looking into the, the fuzzing as well. And yeah, like one of the hardest things is to know, like, uh, is to then look back and see, like, is there some behavior that we like we can observe that we is not right? <laughs> like to actually, uh, right. we can like imitate whole bunches of different behaviors, fuzzy behaviors, like with different votes and pre-votes sent in different orders and timing and stuff like this. But then to then be able to analyze well, what actually happened and is that something we don't want to happen is kind of like a different question and probably something that I still haven't really got to yet. Exactly. Especially when it's around uh, liveness issues, right? That Because it's like, I mean, really the issues are the core things we're looking for are violations of safety or liveness. So either two people commit different blocks or... Uh, you know, we fail to make progress and, you know, how long do we wait? Because depending on what's going on, it could it could correctly take a long time to make progress. And so it's hard to really know that um, you're not making progress for the wrong reason rather than for the right reason. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of obvious from the logs here that, okay, there was a real issue because everyone's proposing blocks and they're all invalid and we don't really have that many Byzantine proposers. But 
you know, how easy would it have been to encode that like programmatically so we could have detected it. Maybe that particular case would have been would have been doable, but other cases might be uh, might be more challenging. And even you know, and I'll point this out that um, probably because I just didn't I just didn't have the patience to think think too hard about it. But I you know this is very very sloppy here, right? This just says uh, you know wait wait for ten blocks because I wasn't sure at which block this bad thing was actually going to trigger everyone to halt. And so you know uh, you could probably make this tighter. And make it two or three or something, but I just didn't. I didn't have the patience at the time to like actually think through and, and figure it out. Um, so I just did something clumsy like ten, and then so now it means when it's correct for this thing to run, we're still going to wait ten blocks, which is you know just going to slow down the tests for everyone, and you know that's that's not great. So um, this kind of thing is definitely something that can, that can be improved and figuring out better conditions for understanding that something went wrong rather than this just like blunt force timeout. Um, also, what does it mean? What does it mean to wait? What if it's late? It's bad? Well, we're waiting. So this is a, so th there's a pretty long timeout in here, I think. Um, Five minutes. It's minutes. Five minutes. To time. Five minutes. So if, if, we don't make, if we don't make 10 blocks in five minutes, then, you know, that's probably pretty likely uh, something's going wrong. Totally. <laughs> 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 Anyway, super interesting. Though. Very, very, very good stuff. Thank Thanks. you very much for doing this. This was yeah, this was very educational for me. I love I love doing this, and so we've done we've done it a few times in the past with other bugs that we fixed, and then we went through the consensus, and we're like, okay, why does this make sense to fix it like this? But um, yeah, probably we should do one where we just step back and do it, you know, not not in response to a bug, but just like let's let's try to understand what's going on here and. There, you know, it's all very subtle and hard to think about. So, um, yeah, a lot of improvements could probably be made to this uh, incrementally as well. So, I think there's a lot of opportunity to make incremental uh, clarifying changes. So, yeah. Totally. Okay, uh, I'm going to end the recording now.